we are here to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Sisters, brothers, it's good to be with you again. Actually, it's depressing to be with you again. It's, it's, I mean, it's good to be amongst friends, but how many times have we done this? Here we are again. And yet the situation for Julian hasn't changed, and yet here I have this worn-out poster now, courtesy of my friend Luke Cornish, the, the crucified Assange. Time marches on, the suffering of Julian continues, and I, I know there's plenty of people who say they find this image offensive. It seems to me the longer we go on, the, the more appropriate it becomes, because the whole concept of crucifixion as a form of imperial control was that it was a slow way of killing someone. I mean, it, it was a good way of getting rid of your enemies, but it was a way of doing it slowly. I mean, people would die over days and even over weeks. Um, I often think of the image on the Via Appia. It was 200 kilometers long, 73 BC, that the revolt of Spartacus, the great slave revolt, was put down. 6,000 slaves, men I assume, 6,000 men, crucified across the Via Appia. I did the maths, that means every 75 meters you'd see a, a tortured soul on either side of the road. Uh, it's the same length as from Sydney to Goulburn. It's a, that's a trip I take quite regularly. And I imagine what it'll be like every 75 metres from Sydney all the way to Goulburn, seeing on either side of the road the figure of a tortured body slowly dying. I mean, some would be dead, some would be in agony still dying, some would be being visited by birds of prey, others would be being humiliated by passers-by. You'd get the message, wouldn't you? I mean, this wasn't just a way of efficiently disposing of your enemies. It was a way of disposing with them slowly and publicly. And it, this is why the cross, before it was ever a symbol of faith, was a symbol of imperial control. It was a way of, in which the empire lets you know that we are powerful, you are nothing. We have control of life and death. You do what we say, you don't speak up. Or you will be in, or, or this is what will happen to you. I don't know if there's other fans of Naomi Wolf here. I've recently read her book, Facing the Beast. Interesting, she see, seriously suggests in that, that we may be seeing in our day resurgence of some of the ancient gods, the gods of Rome, and before that, the gods of the Canaanites and the Amorites, gods like Molech and Baal, gods that demand human sacrifice. I think she proposes this quite seriously, and, and I, th I think it needs to be taken seriously, for I do think that the sinister nature of our world and the despicable way in which Julian has been treated goes beyond just the evil machinations of individual human beings. We're dealing with something really deep and sinister and powerful. It is ultimately, I believe, a spiritual battle, which is depressing, but at the same time deeply encouraging, because I think, again, we come back to this symbol of the cross. I think we're on the right side of this battle. Ultimately, I do believe that these forces of, frankly, just forces of wickedness that are silencing free speech and that are crucifying the messenger will have to ultimately be defeated. That the very fact that the symbol of imperial power became a symbol of faith is a reminder that ultimately there are some people who cannot be crucified. There are some voices that cannot be silenced. Julian, I believe, will come back. And next time we meet, I trust, next time we're all together, I trust it won't be for yet another protest but we will meet to celebrate the resurrection of our brother, and we will do it with great joy. God bless you. Well, that, thanks everyone for coming out today. I want to start by acknowledging this is First Nations and Skadigal and pay our collective respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, always was and always will be. Well, I've got to tell you, um, Albanese is feeling the heat today, isn't he? Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> And so he bloody should be. Because actually the movement 
to free Julian Assange and bring him home is growing and growing around the world. And, and if, you, if you'd asked me two years ago, where were we? I would have said, well, we need to rebuild the movement. We need a, a global movement to support Julian, a truth teller who should not be in jail in a high security prison in the UK with one of Australia's allies facing extradition to high security permanent jail with another one of Australia's allies in the United States. What, what country allows two of its closest allies to treat one of its own citizens, a citizen journalist like that? Well, only a country that's willing to roll over and have its belly tickled um, when its masters in Washington or London do so. And if Prime Minister Albanese is to be a genuine Prime Minister for Australia, that means standing up to the United States. That means saying Australia will stand up for its citizens and will not permit a law of the United States to say wherever Australian citizens are anywhere on the planet that a United States law can reach and pluck them out of their homes if they dare tell the truth about United States war crimes. How could our Prime Minister not condemn that law and demand the return of Julian? How could he? Well, the only way is if you surrender sovereignty to the United States, like the Albanese government and before that the Morrison government was willing to do shame, shame on our government for doing that. But I said that the movement is growing and um, I was very lucky to be on a, on a delegation crowdfunded by Assange supporters, so let me thank you all for that, um, with a an eclectic group of Australian MPs and Senators that went to Washington, from Barnaby Joyce on one side to my colleague Peter Wish Wilson, Greens uh, Senator for Tasmania on the other. Um, and we went, the six of us, Labor, Coalition, Greens, Independents, we went to Washington to stir up a hornet's nest. And we went to Washington because we thought the campaign had slowed in Washington and many members of Congress were not aware of, of, of just how real the campaign was. And I've got to tell you now that that is continuing to bear fruit. We've had joint letters signed by Democrats and Republicans from across the political spectrum demanding Julian Assange's release, demanding the end of charges. And just in the last few days, a fresh resolution has been tabled in Congress, again, sponsored by members of Congress from across the political spectrum. Yeah. Um, demanding, on the basis of the US First Amendment and free speech rights, demanding that the Biden administration end the prosecution and let Julian Assange come home. And we could all join with that, because that's our ultimate goal. So I'll finish with this, because on a day like this, short speeches are good speeches. I will continue to press the likes of Penny Wong to actually show some backbone and stop saying that this is all just a matter for the courts and she can't intervene. She's never said that in relation to freeing Australians from China. She's never said that in relation to freeing Australians from Iran. She's never said that about freeing Australians or other citizens from Russia. It's just that when it's one of the great and powerful allies of Australia, that this government just surrenders its will. And it's not enough just to endlessly ceaselessly repeat the mantra that it's gone on too long. Australia should put some critical assets on the line in the relationships and say to the United States, well, if you don't read Julian Assange, you've got a six months where your ships can't visit Australian ports. If you don't free Julian Assange, we're going to stop this cooperation with you. Put something meaningful on the table, like it matters, because it does. And let's keep pushing our government until they make it matter, until Julian can be home with his wife and his kids in Australia, being a proud, brave, journalist citizen. Thanks very much. I find it difficult to, to believe it's, it's been so long that the, the time that Julian has been incarcerated and how long this campaign has taken. I want to thank everyone that's turned up today, the organisers and in particular the people that have dedicated so long of, of their time and dedication to this cause which is so important it is so fundamental about over a decade ago WikiLeaks revealed an incredible amount of US diplomatic cables in terms of their relations the United States relations diplomatic relations with Latin American countries 
those revelations caused a lot of embarrassment with, for certain countries in Latin America. It caused a lot of embarrassment for the United States. It highlighted not necessarily highly sensitive information, but it highlighted how the United States does business around the world, how the United States does business in Latin America, its historical backyard. It's embarrassing. It was embarrassing for them. Uh, industrial espionage against uh, Brazil, uh, attempting to find out if the president of Argentina, Cristina uh, Kirchner de Fernandez, uh, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, uh, it, whether she was on any medications because her husband had uh, recently died. Um, the list went on and on and on. And the United States was quite upset because, again, it took away the mask, the facade that they have, that they support freedom, that its government supports democracy around the world. That's so far removed from the truth. Uh, in Latin America, uh, for example, in the country of Colombia, there was a civil war that raged on for almost 50 years. The United States had no problems supporting the most reactionary forces inside the country. Forces that killed hundreds, even in fact thousands of trade union leaders, uh, progressive social activists, environmentalists, and the list just goes on and on and on and on. Even today, after seven years of a peace agreement, uh, the uh, Colombian state, uh, there, are, there are serious errors and failures in, in that peace agreement. Do you want to know who actually contributed to creating peace, to, to getting the FARC guerrillas to sign an agreement with the Colombian state? It was Cuba. It was Venezuela. You know, the international boogeymen of Latin America, they actually managed to uh, you know, contributed to sitting the guerrillas down and, and talking to them and saying, "Look, let's let's really let's try and find what points we can we can ha we have in common. You have in common with the Colombian state." I, I haven't read anything positive about the United States in those peace negotiations. You know, I know about Plan Colombia. I know about funding for weapons. I know about Israeli military advisors in uh, in Colombia, uh, but I, but I don't know about U.S. diplomats working. Uh, into overdrive for peace in Colombia. Again, we move on. Uh, Ecuador, Ecuador, there was an attempted uh, coup d'etat uh, in Ecuador uh, 2011 or 12, if my memory serves me correctly. Uh, US uh, diplomacy, United States was happy to fund uh, sectors of the Ecuadorian police force. And uh, when the president at the time, Rafael Correa, uh, attempted to negotiate with them, uh, they decided to kidnap him. And there were plans in place to carry out a coup d'etat. The coup d'etat did not work out. Um, but, you know, what do you think, take a wild guess, what the role of the United States was uh, in those developments? I shouldn't even say, you know. They were not in favor of a progressive uh, government in Ecuador. In fact, the president of the country, of the country at the time, Rafael Correa, talked about how a U.S. base in Ecuador, the lease for the U.S. base was not going to be renewed under his administration. And he said, quite sensibly in my opinion, uh, the day that the United States allows for an Ecuadorian military base in the United States, then we can talk about uh, Ecuador having a U.S. military base, uh, about the United States having a military base in Ecuador. So Julian Assange, believe it or not, is known widely throughout Latin America. He is respected in Latin America. WikiLeaks is respected in Latin America. I hope one day we see statues to Assange in Latin America. I hope we see something here in Australia, his place of birth. And I, it, it, it really, it saddens me, but it also gives me encouragement to see that you guys are still going, you know, that you're still doing the groundwork, that he is not alone. And Albo, I mean, mate, you're a disappointment, honestly. You know, how much does it take to, to speak a few words for an Australian citizen? You know, the Washington, the, the, the New York Times, the, the Washington Post, all the major uh, newspapers were happy to collaborate with WikiLeaks when they thought there was something in it for them. 
but then when the US government decides to go after WikiLeaks, after Assange, they are leaving, you know, up to, 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 to hang up and dry. I mean, pathetic, you know, unacceptable, completely unacceptable. Shame, exactly, shame, you know. So, uh, again, Penny Wong, uh, Prime Minister uh, Albanese, do something, say something, act. Don't just claim that you're engaging in, you know, uh, uh, diplomatic, uh, you know, closed negotiations. I mean, we, we, we don't believe it. We just don't believe you anymore, okay? Assange needs to come home. He needs to come home. Uh, he needs to engage in, in his job uh, as, as an editor, as, an, as a journalist. And uh, from uh, Latin America, uh, I can tell you many people appreciate him. Uh, so thank you for allowing me here to, to speak with you today. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to everybody. I've had tremendous support. And as we expected, as I always expected, um, we could well lose the battle, but we will win the war. You know, there's no doubt about it. Uh, the government is a bit like... Uh, the character Cartman in uh, <laughs> the animated series, uh, stamping their feet and saying, you will respect our authority. You know, you must respect our authority. But uh, the more shrill they get, um, the more they flash their plastic baton around, um, the more uh, people realize it. You know, I went, I went to a comedy uh, act the other day of, and um, uh, Jordan Shanks and, and it, you know he pointed me out in the crowd and I got a standing ovation from everybody in the crowd you know that's the real Australia um, this very cosseted uh, strange uh, small circle in Canberra that um, echo chamber that says national security, that says Julian Assange has damaged national security by releasing the truth. You know, that that becomes increasingly hollow. And yet people who work for the government, you know, they, they I think they probably really believe it. Mark Dreyfus released something, I think, today about how wonderful his reforms were and uh, transparency in uh, the rule of law and anti-corruption. He's got no idea, um, but the people do. The people know what's really going on. And uh, as I've said before, and I can't, I can't obviously, I want to avoid specific details about today or about my case, but um, I always go back to the uh, historical um, details and about the men that uh, translated the Bible into English um, and they were murdered by the state and the state that those people who uh, who did that convinced themselves that these uh, uh, the simple act of translating the Bible out of um, Latin into English was a state uh, was a threat to national security um, you know, and only about 10 years after the Tyndall was murdered um, by the state and by Thomas More, of all people, behind it, you know, who, who obviously thought he was a bit like Dreyfus, thought he, he was knew the law. Um, the Tyndall's English version um, became the standard Bible. Now, it's, uh, that's the world we live in. People convinced, Mike Pizzullo's of the world convinced that they uh, are actually uh, supporting the government but don't realise that by becoming an effectively lawless society, a police state where truth tellers are put in jail on the say-so of people who have already sold our country out to another country, um, that lie that national security is protected by keeping government crimes secret will only last so long. Uh, in my case, they never looked at the conduct 
In Julian's case, they never looked at the conduct exposed. That never came into it. The only thing that came into it was whether or not it was classified information, as if that overrides any criminal conduct. Now, clearly it doesn't. Clearly, in first-year law, you know that. Uh, you know that. Uh, we will win this. We will absolutely win this. And uh, history has been made, the best history anyway, has been made by people like you that stand up in the face of apathy, stand up in the face of those who support uh, government just because it's in their own interest. If you do something because you're going to be promoted and going to be thanked for it, you're not acting in the national interest, you're acting in self-interest. You people, on the other hand, aren't here because you're going to get promoted. You're not here because you're going to get a pat on the back down in the boys' club of Canberra, girls' club. You're here. Um, you're in direct contrast to the people who ran the robo-net scheme. Uh, who lied and cheated and uh, in the name of their own self-advancement and they got caught out. And now we have a race to the bottom over the latest High Court judgment, which obviously said you can't hold people in jail indefinitely uh, unless they've been sentenced. It's a pretty obvious principle, but both sides of the government, both sides of, po of politics can't do enough. Um, to uh, thwart the law uh, simply because they might they think there might be a few votes in it. Anyway, you know all that and I just want to thank you. I've had tremendous amount of support. I don't feel like a criminal. Um, I will go to whatever fate uh, awaits me um, in, the, uh, in March with my head held high and with a sense of dignity. Um, and I will use my own uh, appearance, my own uh, character and sense of self um, to contrast against those who hide in the shadows, uh, speak out of the corner of their mouths and put me in, uh, in jail and say I'm a criminal. Um, I can't do it without you. I could not, um, there's only so much one person can do. Julian can't do it without you. Um, and uh, it's really all the same kind of case, state power getting out of control. But the way we can beat it is to, is to speak quietly uh, with dignity and repeat the same mantra. It can never be a crime to expose a crime. But it is something that uh, whatever happens to Julian, whatever happens to me in years to come, I can, um, I can guarantee you, you'll all be very, very proud for taking the stance uh, that you took today uh, and yesterday and last year and next year. Uh, you are the people that make, um, will save the world, will save Australia. Uh, and while it's a thin red line at the moment, um, that's where the greatest battles have been won by. And uh, again, I just can't thank you enough. Without your support, I would really would be dead. And um, so would Julian probably. And uh, with your support, we can, uh, we can really uh, change the world and we'll certainly leave a legacy that we can be very, very proud of. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go uh, together on a, a little journey, um, if you will. Tomorrow is the 75th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights. All genius arises from within the people of a nation. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the secular Bible our by all of us. It was fathered by Herbert Bear Evatt, an Australian. Take the opportunity to reverence those Australians that have contributed, that have arisen 
out of the people and displayed the genius of the people. Herbert Bear Evert, John Pilger, Julian Assange, David McBride, Wilfred Burchett. They are ours. We created them from within us, within the culture of us. Forget that not, for it is ours. Grasp it to your heart, for it gives strength and understanding that this is what we have done and can do. As uh, David Shoebridge mentioned, Julian Assange can be freed with a phone call. The government can ring up their colleagues in the United Kingdom and say, you know, send him home. His uh, visa's expired. You've served the expiration date d uh, notice on him. Anything that the United States wants, we can handle here. That is a clear possibility. It's not done. For 13 years, we witnessed acquiescence to whatever the United States and the United Kingdom wanted to do to Julian. 13 years of it. Acquiescence means complicity. You're in if you don't act. If you know and you don't act, then you're in. No other way. Can't escape. That's it. And that's how it was for these 13 years. We participated in the, to use Father Dave's word, in sending a man to Calvary. We participated. It's changed now. All of the people of Australia have bound together and brought into being a name that spread into government, into parliament, into the Congress, that Julian must be returned home. So it's our congratulations that Anthony Albanese says in Parliament, I see no benefit in this persecution continuing. Well, he doesn't say persecution, I'll help him out there. He's a nice man, needs a hand. Next. Julian Assange, Chelsea Manning and David McBride gave us the last glimpses of reality. As you may feel, we haven't had any understanding of what is reality since then. Now we see, through the benefit of social media and our cameras and our relationship with each other, the catastrophe unfolding before our eyes in Gaza. 70 journalists have been killed in Gaza. 70. The other day, a dear man, I'll finish with this, if you're patient enough. Rafat Aria was targeted, a journalist, was targeted in his sister's home. He was killed. His brother was killed. His sister was killed. The four children were killed. He wrote a poem, which I'll read to you. I've tried to memorize it, but forgive me. Just take a second to get there. It's worth it. This is if titled, If I Must Die. It's not long. And it bears weight upon all of us. For we are the understanding and the power that will change these circumstances. Not them, us. For as we have changed Julian's circumstances, where he is just about on the cusp of being freed. Us. 
If I must die, you must live. To tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some strings, make it white with a long tail, so that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who left in a blaze, and bid not one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself. Seize the kite, my kite you made, flying up above, and thinks for a moment an angel is there, bringing back love. Let it bring hope. Let it be my tale. Thank you. I first have the duty because I've been asked to do it, to read out a statement from my journalist union, Mia. And that's also Julian Assange's journalist union. He was granted an honorary lifetime membership from Mia under the previous director. This statement is signed by its current president, Karen Percy. Now folks, I'm not gonna say these are not my words, but I have highlighted a couple of things that I would just like to clarify for you because I think it's quite important to do so. So here it goes. The continued pursuit of Julian Assange is a direct threat to media freedom around the world. From the outset, the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance has stood up for Julian, not just because He's one of our members, but because of what the case is against him. It represents, for the role of journalism and journalists, a threat, and it threatens sources that we rely on. It's been great to see Australian delegations visit the US to lobby for his release. Disappointingly, there seems to be little will from those who could change the outcome for Julian to do so. In fact, all the talk of commitment to supporting the role of journalism in our society, our leaders are betrayed by their actions. The most recent case, of course, that of whistleblower David McBride, who was acting in the interest of the public by briefing journalists, but is being punished for doing so, exposing the wrongdoing of soldiers on the battlefield, as David and Julian have done, is important in holding the powerful to account. But the public's right to know is imperiled when those who are brave enough to speak out are charged and imprisoned. The media in Australia is currently facing one of its most testing times. The current violence in Gaza and the information of that war that surrounds it pose great challenges for journalists trying to inform audiences and readers. Propaganda and fake videos and photos on social media add a toxic mix to an already tense situation where views are entrenched and trust in short supply. When credible whistleblowers with evidence are crushed, what hope do we have when war crimes are committed in the current climate? We hope that the authorities will soon come to their senses and release Julian. Our thoughts are with his family and support network. That's signed by Mia. Now what I think really requires clarification. There's a point to it. Uh, David and Julian are grouped together here. Legally speaking, they are quite different. It would be more appropriate, you, you know that Julian is a journalist and David McBride a heroic whistleblower. They both deliver us information, but they're different from the outset. They have different challenges facing them. So Julian would be more appropriately 
compared to Dan Oates from the ABC, whom the CDPP, right, Commonwealth Direction of Public Prosecutions, gave a public interest reason to the AFP not to prosecute Dan. And the AFP followed that advice. Now, why is there no consistency between Dan Oakes and Julian Assange? And why is there no public interest for David McBride when the person who actually passed it on to us, he, he's doing that in the public interest. It's inconsistent. So I think it's important that we understand the difference and we push to expand that definition of public interest and how it is applied to the people who bring us truthful information. The second point that I would kind of draw exception to is this focus on social media as source of toxicity. I think the most dangerous, toxic, harmful and widely disseminated lies are the official lies. And we have lots of information. I brought my visual aid. Anyone recognize the van? Where does that van come from? Who recognizes the van? It's from the collateral murder video. Well, just up above, and I'm just going to lay these out. I don't have time to go through them all, but you can do that because they're all self-explanatory. This was the official story originally that was given to Reuters by the military. The generals didn't show Dane Yates the van part because there, there was a, an obvious war crime. He didn't see that and he was led to believe it was his cameraman's fault why he got shot. So we had WikiLeaks to actually bring us the truth and we had the whistleblower, Chelsea Manning. You know, in more modern times, we have terrible lies. Terrible lies that some people here today can relate to. Al Jazeera was accused of publishing a photo of a plastic doll pretending that it was a baby, a dead baby. Well, they were exposed by this little known independent outlet. I've never heard of them before. They're called Boom. And folks, his name was Muhammad Hani al Zahar. It was a real child. So these kinds of toxic lies, we have Mark Regov, Melbourne-born Mark Regov, advisor to Benjamin Netanyahu, telling us to take the figures about the dead, the numbers with a grain of salt. I quote him there. But you know who else we have? We have Iraq body count. And some of you might remember them because they requested of WikiLeaks that they use their data. What they did was prove, prove those people died by finding out their names, by getting their ID numbers their ID numbers to show the public their original names and then transliterations into English so, and the actual number in the list of dead and tragically their age, so many less than a year old. And the proof in the end, in the analysis, after rigorous research and analysis from an unbiased party John Sloboda testified in Julian Assange's extradition hearing. He was the founder of Iraq Body Count. He's not from Iraq. It's just a job that he does. He tries to bring justice. And David McBride said recently, give them a name. Find out what their names are so that people can have empathy. Because what's being done here, misleading us, that, that's to short circuit our empathy. So we don't finally say, this is enough. We're not going to take it anymore. But lots of people are. Now, I was going to say one more word in response to, I don't know, who heard David Shoebridge speak in the Senate with yes. Penny Wong yes. and ask her about the recent Supreme Court 
ruling in the UK in relation to refugees. Now, Craig Murray published an article saying this ruling gives hope for Julian Assange. Why is that? Because the ruling was that it is no longer the business of a Home Secretary to determine if a country is a safe country. What would she know after a couple of diplomatic notes? It has to be done in a court, in the, by the Supreme Court, with solid evidence. Track history, current situation now, and it has to be assessed by judges. So, of course, that applies to Julian's case because now, now, really, uh, David is asking, well, we should take a look at this because Priti Patel determined that it was a safe country, well, actually safe prisons that Julian Assange was being sent to, but the lower court judge didn't determine that. She determined that it was so bad and the expert witnesses said they were so bad that he would surely commit suicide and all of the expert medical witnesses agreed, right? So the thing is, <laughs> if it's not the job of a Home Secretary to determine the safety of a country, is it the job of a judge, no matter how high his rank is, and I'm talking about Lord Chief Justice Ian Burnett, who ignored the fact that Julian Assange had a stroke in court. His medical condition has really changed. So there's a second reason why a judge is not to determine she'll be right, mate, for Julian with a bottle of his anti-stroke medication in his pocket when he's bundled off to a, a hellhole. That's just looking for trouble. And that's, there are two good reasons now why Julian Assange's uh, case extradition case in relation to U.S. assurances needs urgent review and we should push for that. Thank you. It's kind of difficult for me to stand here in front of you today after so many eloquent and important people have gotten up to speak before me. And you may be asking, why is it that I should be getting up here to speak when there are so many other more important and relevant people who have given us such useful and first-hand information. My brothers and sisters, my name is Tom Toby. I am an Australian of Lebanese heritage. I travel to Iraq every single year and have done so since 2014 on a pilgrimage. And I ask myself, as a, an Australian Muslim man of Arab heritage, I ask myself, what would I know about what happened in Iraq during the war were it not for people like Julian Assange? Yes, right on. And I ask myself, to what extent would the Australian government have been complicit were it not for the people like Julian Assange? I ask myself, how many nameless, faceless children who would have disappeared into the ages, into the graves, mass graves, without their name ever known were it not for people like Julian Assange. Amen. I have stood in my own pathetic way, really, for Julian since the very beginning. And I have cried tears for what that man has to go through, for what he continues to go through. And I cry tears of anger and rage when I think to myself how complicit the hypocrite in this office and the hypocrites like him here in Australia and the hypocrites like him all over the world hide their faces 
and give us their bullshit excuses as to why they cannot free an Australian citizen whose only crime was to tell the truth against this Western bullshit democracy that we want to hold on to so tightly. And I think to myself, how much they scare us. And they say, well, you know, you should be thankful that you're not living in China. We should be thankful that we are not living in Russia. And I think, well, how much more different could it be? We're doing what they do. Maybe we're a little jealous of them that they do it a little more efficiently than we do. We do. But stay on this path and we will end up there soon enough. I've heard it said to me before, you bloody wog, go back to your own country. And I looked at them and I said, this is my country and I was born here. And it's not that I think that other countries are better or worse. I just expected a hell of a lot more from this country. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When you are going to stand there, and of course I'm speaking to the government, when you are going to stand there and lecture the world on what it is to be a Western democracy, but you have not got a mumbling word to say about your own citizen, whose only crime was to speak the truth, and shame on you. Yes, shame. And I think to myself, you know, if we are going to spend billions of dollars on purchasing submarines from our ally, the United States, after we shagged our other ally in France, well, at least we could have put a covey on it and said, We'll buy your bloody submarines, but why don't you release one of our own and bring him back home? Yeah, yeah. But that's not what we did. This is not who we are as a nation. I'm embarrassed to call myself an Australian. And the only thing that I have left to love in this country are the people that stand before me my Aboriginal brothers and sisters, those who would stand against injustice everywhere and not just depending on the colour of the skin of the person we're outraged for. My brothers and sisters, I've spent the last two months shaking with rage. And what has happened in Palestine I spoke to a journalist not so long ago and I said to her, because she looked like she was struggling, the poor thing, and I said, look, if you're not sure how to fill columns in a newspaper, just write down the names of the children that Australia has supported the killing of in Palestine and you won't run out of words to say. And when I said that to her, I remembered my brother Julian, my mentor, the one that I look up to, the highest of this country. And I think to myself, Julian, if you hadn't have been arrested back then, you would have been arrested this time. Yeah. And if you hadn't have been arrested this time, there would have been something else for you to be arrested over because I know you would not give up the cause for your own safety and your own well-being. And I just wish that governments here and overseas, and I'm not going to talk about the Israeli government because, well, when you have a man of the clergy here, Satan need not be mentioned. <laughs> but I say to people, of good faith and yes I include my atheist brothers and sisters because good faith is something that comes from within I say to my brothers and sisters of good faith 
Do not forget your brother Julian Assange. Do not forget your brother McBride. Do not forget the needy and the massacred all over the world. And you are the ones to be proud. God bless you all.